Hello friends and uh, welcome back. So uh, we have been talking about sludge processing and treatment uh, this week and in the previous lecture we did talk about the uh, first major step which is taken in the sludge processing which is sludge thickening. Uh, in this particular lecture, we are going to discuss the sludge stabilization and its conditioning. So, we will begin with the uh, sludge stabilization. Stabilization essentially is a digestion process. So, sludge is stabilized uh, intent which is kind of idea is to reduce the biological and chemical reactivity of the sludge. Then we, what we call it to be like a stabilized sludge when there is not of not much of biological or chemical reactions taking place within the sludge zone or within the sludge medium. And this is typically achieved through biological processes which is called sludge digestion. So, essentially sludge stabilization we are talking about sludge digestion there are thermal digestion processes as well, but biological digestion uh, processes predominate the thermal digestion processes. So, that way we have the sludge stabilization through either thermal means or through uh, biochemical means. Okay. Now, essentially in the biological sludge stabilization, the organic solids that are decomposed to stable substances because those are the one which, who are reactive who basically gets react who can uh, convert to the newer cell mass or uh, other things within the sludge zone. So, they are digested to form stable substances or stable components. The digestion reduces the kind of total mass of the solid that is one thing it does. It destroys the pathogens typically. So, that way digestion can be considered as a disinfectant process as well. However, it is not that effective in destroying pathogens always. Okay. If we go for thermal digestion then it will, but uh, typical biological digestion may will have some effect on the uh, like removal of killing of pathogens as well. But it cannot put a guaranteed disinfectant sludge. Okay. So, then and uh, other thing it will do it will make easier for dewatering. So, it will make easier uh, to dewater or dry the sludge into kind of inoffensive rich potting soil like appearance. Okay. Now, usually the anaerobic digestion is preferred for sludge stabilization while aerobic digestion can also be used, but it is the anaerobic digestion which is more popular. So, if we see the uh, kind of pre-treatment that is needed for digestion. So, uh, we get sludge from either primary sludge from sedimentation or secondary sludge from secondary clarifier. The first thing we do is sludge thickening which we discussed in the previous class. So, that is kind of uh, preliminary requirement for digestion because otherwise the water content is very high uh, particularly with the secondary sludge when it is high more than 99 percent water content. So, then the uh, stabilization process becomes uh, really, uh, really difficult and we have to basically handle a large volume of sludge as well. So, that is why uh, idea is to first thicken the sludge, reduce the uh, water content, increase the solid content and reduce the volume largely because as we were discussing through just thickening process we can reduce the volume by almost 90 percent if we effectively kind of thicken the sludge. So, that way instead of having uh, like uh, handling a much much larger volume if we are able to handle just 10 percent of the volume it be makes our process far more economical and far more effective. So, uh, anaerobic digestion typically will then like the thickened sludge is brought to the digester and there this anaerobic digestion takes place. So, there would be uh, some amount of heating and mixing may be provided and then there would be energy generation or uh, in the form of biogas which will come out of the digester. Okay. And after that the digested sludge is further taken for dewatering purpose in the different setups or equipment where we may need to add flocculent or so we will consider dewatering processes later on. But for uh, typical digestion uh, perspective, so thickening is needed which we have already discussed and then it is brought to the anaerobic digestion. So, anaerobic digestion is typically a biological degradation of organic matter which are present in the sludge okay. and it is usually performed in a biodigester what typically we call and this biodigester is kind of an air and uh, water tight structure 
which provides the anoxic conditions within ok. And these biodigesters can be operated in a batch or continuous configuration and can be either single uh, stage or dual stage digesters ok. So, during this process uh, majority of the organic matter is converted into biogas which is methane and carbon dioxide. So, essentially we are having or lot of organic matter coming in this sludge and as like we discussed that the V s to T s content the volatile solids to total solids content in the uh, particularly the secondary sludge if we talk about or primary sludge. So, uh, in the primary sludge it is of the kind of 70 to 75 per uh, percent that range and in secondary sludge also it will be uh, more than uh, 60 percent typically. So, there is a lot of organic matter there is lot of volatile solids present in the sludge and that can be kind of processed for the digestion and then the organic matter or organic sludge which is present in there eventually converts to the biogas in the form of methane and carbon dioxide. This processes can reduce the organic matter content by 40 to 50 percent. So, almost half of the organic matter can be digested that way and this process uh, can either be like thermophilic digestion in which the sludge is fermented and takes at a temperature ranges of around 55 degree Celsius or in a mesophilic range where temperature is around 36, 37 degree Celsius. So, it can be done that way in either uh, setups. A typical digester will basically have a mixing zone, a sludge zone, then fluid zone that way. So, if you essentially see it is a prototype of any typical anaerobic processes will be of uh, the anaerobic typical reactions which we discussed earlier. So, there will be hydrolysis and acetogenesis taking place, there is acetogenesis taking place, there is methanogenesis and then there is overall reaction which can take place. So, uh, the, the idea of like the anaerobic digestion of the sludge is to first break down the again the larger chain compound carbohydrate protein to this uh, like uh, short chain organic acids and then convert these to acetic acid through acetogenesis process then methanogenesis will convert these to methane and carbon dioxide ok and then there are some other trace elements that is how the digestion takes place. So, uh, as we said that this digestion could be low rate or high rate digestion process. So, what happens in a low rate digestion if we see the feed that we get in ok, the feed that we get in eventually comes to a closed chamber because it is anaerobic digestion. So, there will be like uh, there will be an active zone where this sludge gets digested and that once it gets digested it will try to settle it will come to the lower zone. So, then digested uh, sludge settles in here the supernatant water will come here and then a scum layer could be formed and the gas can be collected here. So, this is a typically low rate digestion where processes are taking place in this uh, way itself. Then we have a high rate digestion process where we do complete mixing. Here since digestion is taking place in a selective zone the processes are slow it is not well mixed system. So, the rate is slow and that is why we call it low rate digestion, but if we actually make this entire digester volume as an active zone through complete mixing. So, uh, then the micro uh, then kind of like entire mass is entire mass of the sludge is under active zone and then digestion takes place not only in the selected zone or selected patch, but in this entire reactor and that leads to basically uh, higher rate of digestion and that is why we call it high rate processes ok. And then again the digested sludge can be taken down for dewatering purpose and gas can be collected from the top that way. So, that will be basically uh, high rate uh, high rate digestion and low rate digestion. Uh, we have single stage and two stage or what we call as dual stage digestion as well. So, in, in single stage digestion uh, again it is typical process as we were uh, just looking at. So, we will get raw sludge in there will be active digestion, there will be supertent, there will be scum formation, then gas storage and gas can be taken, digested sludge will come at the bottom. So, that kind of uh, typical slow rate digestion. The dual stage digestions are which is done in two stages and are much faster. So, they are like uh, usually high rate digestion 
and which is typically done in a two stage. So, what happens here that we get the raw sludge in and uh, through a kind of motor we ensure this mixing over here. So, this uh, and then we have intermittent sludge holder if needed. Here the sludge is well mixed and there is a gas generated which takes place and this first stage is uh, kind of completely mixed. Okay. So, uh, there is like since completely mixed obviously the digestion rate will be faster. Okay. So, that takes place here and then mixed sludge is taken out to the second stage. Okay. So, second stage uh, we allow this to settle. So, digested sludge settles over here, supernatant goes here, then scum formation and there will be some gas formation in this one as well. So, that can also be taken out and collectively gas can be taken out. Okay. So, then supernatant goes out from here and uh, your uh, sludge goes out from the lower part. So, that way we can actually done these things in a two stage. So, this active digestion thing is done in a separate stage where this complete mixing is in it ensured in order to get the faster rate of digestion or high rate of digestion whereas, the subsequent processes will be slower that way. Okay. So, that is what is essentially two stage digestion process. Okay. Now, if we see the uh, that is about anaerobic sludge digestion, the aerobic sludge digestion is also done, but it is not that popular because of the its energy uh, footprints. So, in aerobic digestion this process is similar to activated sludge process, it is uh, the like sludge is taken to a chamber where there is a kind of like available substrate or food is depleted. So, there is uh, because it is not the what there is no like water coming in with BOD where their food is available for microorganism. So, when the sludge is taken in a chamber and is actually kind of aerated or kind of uh, like air supply is maintained, but there is no food supply, there is no substrate present in there. So, microorganisms begin to consume their own protoplasm which is kind of uh, like it go in the uh, endogenous phase okay. and uh, then uh, from consuming their own protoplasm they obtain energy for the cell maintenance and the reactions and that way the uh, digestion takes place. So, cell components of the various microorganisms are oxidized into CO2, H2O and ammonia. Uh, actually around 75 to 80 percent of the cell components can be oxidized and the remaining 20 to 25 percent components uh, is composed of inert components and organic compounds that are not biodegradable. Ammonia is uh, like subsequently oxidized to uh, nitrate as the digestion proceeds because the age like in typical uh, activated sludge process we get uh, we keep it for lesser retention time, but for sludge digestion the uh, retention time is much larger. So, the nitrification also takes place over there and ammonia can subsequently be oxidized to nitrate okay. and even the non biodegradable volatile suspended solids may remain as may come as a end product because they are not getting degraded or decomposed in there. So, if we typically consider the cell mass as C 5 H 7 N O 2 which is typical uh, composition of a cell mass it is taken. Of course, there are various uh, formulas for cell mass, uh, we have a much larger formula where there is phosphorus and those kind of things are also involved, but uh, conventional or the more common formula with nitrogen, uh, hydrogen, carbon and oxygen is considered at C 5 H 7 N O 2 for biomass. So, if we take this as a kind of biomass or cell mass okay, which is aerobically digested, so major processes that will happen. So, this will get oxidized first and will convert to CO 2 and uh, this particular compound okay, ammonium bicarbonate that way and then the nitrification will convert this ammonia to nitrate uh, then this overall equation with complete nitrification will be this reacting with the O 2 we can join this. So, we get uh, CO 2 we get H 2 O and we get H N O 3. Now, uh, causing nitrate nitrogen as an electron acceptor because denitrification can also take place particularly in the lower part of the uh, digester where there is not enough oxygen is reaching 
So, in those cases uh, if, if it happens it is not necessarily that it will happen, but if it happens then this nitrate can be converted to the back to ammonia that way. Okay. So, denitrification can also takes place and with complete nitrification and denitrification we get uh, like if we say that nitrification and denitrification both is occurring. So, eventually your cell mass will be converted to CO2, H2O and N2 and that way this will escape the system, this will escape the system. So, that is how the stabilization takes place. Okay. Now, this could be operated in batch or continuous mode the aerobic sludge digestion as well. However, it is not very common due to this energy cost because there is high degree of energy cost associated with the anaerobic sludge digestion processes and that makes it kind of difficult uh, to, uh, to bear the cost of the aerobic digestion by the uh, various wastewater treatment facilities particularly in the uh, like developing world uh, nations. So, that is why this is not that popular okay. and anaerobic decomposition is far more popular as the typical anaerobic processes can actually lead to the uh, production of biogas as well which can make the digestion process self sustainable or can be used for like if you are able to produce biogas or energy in the form of that. So, you can utilize that energy at the plant site itself. Okay. So, uh, those kind of uh, benefits can be obtained by anaerobic digestion where the processes are similar we go for hydrolysis or fermentation acid, acidogenesis, acetogenesis and methanogenesis as we discussed while aerobic. Uh, as we discussed in the presence of oxygen the cell mass or the uh, is kind of oxidized and eventually if it go undergoes complete oxidation and complete nitrification denitrification cycle. So, it can produce the uh, CO2, N2 or those kind of uh, elements and then your organic mass there the cell mass there gets stabilized. So, that is why that is how the aerobic stabilization or aerobic sludge digestion takes place. So, uh, post stabilization what we see is the uh, sludge conditioning. Okay. The sludge conditioning aims to improve the dewatering characteristic. So, what happens if you recall the process that we saw in the earlier class. So, sludge is first thickened and then it is stabilized then it needs to be like for the after the stabilization also we need to because if you are going doing this aerobic stabilization or anaerobic stabilization there is still lot of water present in the sludge and then that water has to be withdrawn for further processing of the sludge. So, for the withdrawal of water the dewatering step is taken place, but in order to improve the efficiency of dewatering in order to make the dewatering more uh, efficient a preliminary step may be adopted which is sludge conditioning. Okay. Now, sludge conditioning just aims to improve the dewatering characteristic of the sludge okay. and the, that way we prepare the sludge for this substantial dewatering processes. Now, it may be accomplished through utilization of uh, inorganic or organic chemicals or by thermal treatment as well. So, there are thermal uh, ways to uh, sludge conditioning and there are chemical ways to sludge conditioning. Now, what happens that in the uh, like this dewatering uh, this sludge conditioning step in usually kept after this sludge has been stabilized, but many times many places uh, this sludge conditioning is done before sludge is sent for the uh, the first thickening stage. Okay. So, even because it will uh, if you stabilize if you kind of condition the sludge. So, its thickening characteristic may also be improved since thickening and dewatering are more more or less have a similar objective when you have too much of water you thicken it to say uh, 1 percent or 2 percent to uh, say up to 10 percent whereas, uh, sub, uh, substantial dewatering aims to increase the solid content up to say 30 percent or so. So, uh, that is the basic difference and in between like with the thickened sludge with the dewater sludge completely like dry sludge we cannot go for this uh, aerobic or anaerobic digestion steps. So, since these steps are to be done in a slurry form or in a in with a sludge having significant amount of water content. So, that is why uh, be, uh, because as we were just discussing the anaerobic digestion. So, what happens in the anaerobic digestion that or for that matter anaerobic digestion also the hydrolysis is a step where these things has to be hydrolyzed. So, there has to be significant water present in the 
uh, system. So, we do not dry the sludge before these processes, but again we can uh, put some con uh, conditioning kind of treatment before thickening as well uh, in terms of adding some flocculant or those kind of thing. But otherwise traditionally thickening is uh, traditionally the sludge conditioning is done after the sludge stabilization or sludge digestion has taken place. So, in conditioning as we are saying that there are uh, approaches we can accomplish it uh, with the utilization of the inorganic or organic chemicals or by thermal treatments. So, for conditioning uh, chemical conditioning purpose the ferric hydroxide, lime, alum which is kind of like traditional flock, uh, coagulants. So, they can be used the salts of iron and alum can be used as a coagulant, lime can also be used uh, basically for generation for stabilizing this thing. Uh, because there might be lot of alkalinity depending on which process it is coming in. So, uh, then there is like uh, various organic polymers can also be used okay, which could be like cationic, anionic or non-ionic polymers. They can also be used to flocculate the sludge and the doses that are needed for these chemicals when we go for chemical conditioning. So, let us say we want to uh, figure out how much dose is to be given of ferric chloride or for alum or for the organic polymer that we have will depend on several factors and prime of them is the characteristic of the sludge. Okay. So, what is the characteristic of the sludge, what is the type of coagulant, what are its uh, what are its properties. So, that will eventually govern how much doses of sludge would be needed and this could typically be estimated based on the simple laboratory trials. Okay. So, we have a kind of like a traditional jar test uh, is used where we have multiple jars in there and we add these different uh, flocculants or the uh, like the different doses of the selected coagulant we add and then we do these processes and see which one is giving the best degree of flocculation. So, that can that dose can be used for the purpose of uh, sludge conditioning okay, the chemical conditioning. Then we have thermal conditioning of the sludge. This thermal conditioning of sludge is done either in uh, wet air oxidation or what we typically call as through heat treatment. So, there are two approaches out of which heat treatment is far more popular as opposed to the wet air oxidation. So, wet air oxidation is typically done at much higher temperature. The temperature ranges some 230 to 290 degrees Celsius and at much elevated pressure also. So, up to 8 uh, like mega Newton per meter square pressure. So, this range of the pressure and temperature is needed for wet air oxidation and what essentially happens that in this oxidation process the solids or the uh, whatsoever uh, organics are present in there, they are reduced to kind of as. So, it is a wet incineration kind of thing because we are doing at much elevated temperature and much higher pressure as well. The traditional heat treatment is done at 170 to 200 degree Celsius range typically at times even lower. So, at times we can do it at around 150 degree Celsius. So, it is done at a lower temperature and 1 to 2 uh, mega Newton per meter square pressure and what this does this traditional heat treatment. Uh, will actually coagulate the solids, break down the gel structure and that way it kind of uh, uh, let the water settle out or squeeze out of the solids and uh, that way improves the dewaterability of the sludge. Okay. And uh, it is more widely used, more commonly used as opposed to the wet, ox wet air oxidation which is a quite energy intensive process because we have to do it at a much elevated temperature and much higher pressure also. So, uh, this thermal treatment uh, kind of produces more readily dewaterable sludge than chemical conditioning. Okay. It is uh, far more effective than chemical conditioning methods, but at the same time uh, the cost is also much higher. In addition, it provides effective disinfection of the sludge because when we do it, uh, when we try to uh, uh, sort of condition the sludge at higher temperature, at elevated temperature. So, bacteria or microorganisms or pathogens cannot sustain those high temperature, cannot sustain like uh, that high temperature when it is uh, the sludge is under stabilization process. So, they will also get killed and that way we get quite effective disinfection of the sludge 
through this process. Okay. Uh, this uh, the heat treatment can also be used not only for conditioning, but as we are suggesting for stabilization also because it uh, like as we are saying that it break downs the organic uh, matter as well. So, that way it can actually kind of stabilizes the sludge also and can be con like the conditioning and stabilization can be achieved in a uh, same setup in that uh, case. However, when we like are trying to kind of uh, stabilize through heat treatment, the disinfection is obtained that is fine, but for the, this disinfection the cell walls of the biological organisms are ruptured and that releases some of the bound organic materials with the water. So, that the water we are getting will may have some more organic matters which have already been uh, say precipitated or uh, converted they may again come back into the water. So, that is one of the aspect of with the thermal uh, heat uh, thermal conditioning particularly with the heat treatment which needs to be seen. And it is usually applicable to biological sludge that may be difficult to stabilize or condition by typical chemical measures or chemical means and that is why it is preferred for biological sludge uh, even after its higher cost whereas, chemical sludge can uh, chemical stabilization can take place at a much lower cost that way. So, if we see the uh, like if we try to compare these various conditioning methods. Okay, so, uh, as we discussed we can have uh, like depending on the conditioning mechanism if we see for if we are using inorganic chemicals. So, conditioning mechanism is coagulation and flocculation for organic chemicals or various organic polymers again the conditioning mechanism is traditional coagulation and flocculation process. Okay. While when we do the thermal treatment heating, so the conditioning mechanism becomes change in the surface properties we are not adding any chemical which can coagulate the sludge that way. So, what happens that its surface properties change the cells are split the chemicals are released and the hydrolysis is done at elevated temperature. So, that is what leads to the conditioning of the sludge. Uh, if we see the effect of the allowable solid loads, so uh, this allows loading increase this also allows loading increase and this significant loading uh, increase is allowed. Uh, supernatant flow if we see, so the increased solid capture there, there will be also increased solid capture. Here there is significant increases in the color suspended solids filtered BOD means uh, soluble BOD because we are causing hydroly hydrolysis of various recalcitrant or the cell system. So, that can be there ammonia, COD those kind of thing can come actually in the supernatant. Uh, if we see the effect on human resources small fact where is this required skilled personnel and a cons uh, like uh, consistent maintenance schedule for the uh, for the uh, heat treatment or thermal stabilization thermal conditioning. And if we see the sludge mass, so here there is kind of like uh, significant increase in the sludge mass not much effect and here the reduced existing mass and maybe increase the mass through the recirculation. So, that is what happens within the reactor when we are within the system when we are trying to condition the uh, when we are trying to do the uh, sludge conditioning. So, that way the sludge is conditioned and uh, once the sludge is conditioned then uh, after that what uh, as a next step we go. So, we have first thickened the sludge then the uh, we did the stabilization of sludge through digestion traditionally anaerobic digestion. Then the sludge is conditioned the digested sludge is conditioned and once the sludge is conditioned then we take it for the next step which is dewatering the sludge where we try to remove majority of the water from the sludge and make it as kind of a dry sludge cake which is produced through the dewatering mechanism. And after that we can think of the next subsequent option in the form of disposal or reuse or uh, incineration those options. So, we will discuss uh, the rest of the uh, processes in the next and the last uh, lecture of this week and for the time being then uh, we call this lecture off. So, thank you for joining and uh, see you in the next lecture. Thank you.